In the midst of constant commotion in the healthcare industry, one unified voice rises above the rest. A beacon bent on banishing biofilm. They are sterile processing professionals who clean and sterilize their way to improved outcomes, and their patient safety victories often go unseen. This is Beyond Clean, the central nexus for the people, processes, and products that are pushing the sterile processing industry forward. Join us every week as we give voice to that global force fighting dirty all around the world. It's time to go Beyond Clean. Welcome back to another edition of Beyond Clean. This week, Hank and I are going to talk with Sean Flynn, a sterile processing operations consultant who brings more than 27 years of combined experience, not only as a clinician, manager, director, and senior level executive within the healthcare industry, but also Sean recently served as Restore Medical Solutions Senior Vice President of Customer Operations and had a focus on regulatory compliance and hospital implementation, just to give you a little bit more as well, because we will get into this. But prior to that role as a Senior Vice President, he served as President and uh, Co-Founder. So he's got a lot of experience with 510K clearance, ISO certifications, and among other operational duties in uh, medical device startups. So this is this is going to be a great interview, Hank. And and again, this is our third in the series so far. Really looking forward to talking to Sean. Oh yeah, I'm pumped. He's got the exact kind of experience to make this type of conversation engaging and educational for our listeners, um, specifically speaking to that IFU piece, I think he's going to be able to bring some stuff out to really give us a lot to chew on. I tend a lot to take away to our facilities um, to hopefully drive some improvement. So super excited, and I can't wait to get him on the line. Yeah, I know we're going to talk to him about a lot of opportunities around those instructions for use, and he'll have a lot of insight into that. As a reminder, you can subscribe to Beyond Clean on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or search for Beyond Clean on your favorite podcast application. We can also be heard on the Sterile Education app, available on iTunes and Android. Follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean, and Instagram, Beyond Clean Podcast. Find our videos, including Fighting Dirty with Hank Balch, Real Talk with Bob Mars, and Beyond the Headlines with Mike Matthews at YouTube.com slash Beyond Clean. Beyond Clean offers social media and podcast consulting for vendors and survey preparation and remote consulting services for hospitals, surgery centers, and clinics. Email info at beyondclean.net for more information. Finally, Beyond Clean has moved to a new format for issuing CE credits for our podcast. We will be releasing Season 1 episodes between now and Season 7, which will air in the new year. This means that all six episodes will be certified in a single package with one quiz and certificate. Be sure to visit our website at beyondclean.net to take the quiz once Season 7 begins airing in January. We'll be right back after a short break. You're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Sean, thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, we're still early in our our podcasting careers, Hank and I. This is our third (laughs) show, and uh, we love that uh, you're willing to make some time to to join us today. Oh, well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. And, uh, yes, it'll, it'll be a pleasure. Well, I think we're definitely going to be uh, having an entertaining topic today. We'll dive into the world of instructions for use and, and many other challenges that face sterile processing. But I'll let Hank kind of kick it off. I know the two of you know each other, and that's actually what's made a lot of these interviews so smooth is is the rapport that, that Hank has had with many of our guests to date already. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping the third time is a charm. You know, first two interviews were fantastic. We have some, uh, we have some great episodes under our belt, but I know this one is going to be just as good, if not better, um, particularly highlighting this IFU question uh, in addition to just seeing a little bit more behind the scenes, possibly for some of our audience, uh, for what it looks like and feels like on the medical device side. So, 
to that point then, Sean, let's get rolling here. Uh, how did you first get involved, uh, particularly with medical devices? So you began your career, I mean, even back before sterile processing, you were in healthcare, but you did your time um, on the front lines in sterile processing as well. Um, how did you first maneuver out of that life into the medical device side? Well, it was kind of it was kind of ironic. I, I think I've always been a, an entrepreneur at heart, and I have a military background, and so I was first introduced to the healthcare sector via the military. Um, I was a surgical assistant in the service in the United States Army, and in the Army or in the military, they actually train you to work in sterile processing as well. Um, so you're cross trained to do both. So during the day, you're doing your procedures up in the main OR. And then once you're finished with your cases, you actually have to reprocess your instruments. So <clears throat> I say this to most people that I talk to that very early on, I appreciated the, uh, the task at hand that still processing has to go through. Um, because, you know, I actually did it and I actually had to do it post surgery. So a lot of the things that come full circle now where we're talking about point of use cleaning and things like that, that was just an intuitive thing that we did because we had to actually reprocess our own instruments. So that was, you know, early 90s. Um, and then I, once I got out of the military, I sweat, segued into biotechnology and tissue banking. And I did that for about uh, 13 years and then found myself back in the healthcare um, working at uh, Grady Memorial Hospital. Um, now, the ironic thing was when I was in biotechnology and tissue banking, it's a highly regulated industry, and, you know, you have to adhere to uh, good tissue practices, which is a, you know, just a final rule that the FDA came out with, um, and a lot of other regulatory rules. So there's clean room environments, um, and it's very particular with their uh, processes and policies, and so when I got back in healthcare in, in Gray Memorial Hospital, um, I found that a lot of things were antiquated and not how I was used to. Um, and when you work for FDA regulated industry, um, like uh, a biotech firm, um, you know, you just are, you get used to certain things, ISO standards, things like that. So when I got in, I, you know, quickly realized that you know, we had to change a lot of the policies and procedures, up the training, um, take out the antiquated equipment, et cetera. And the one thing that I really couldn't solve at the time was how the instruments were being staged, uh, how they come to sterile processing. Hmm. So that was the beginning of where we really started looking at um, the efficiency aspect of it to include the cleanliness aspect of it. So very early on in my training, the military actually pay dividends in actually creating this and, and having some insights into uh, creating a device that actually improves the process, but also improves the outcomes uh, of the decontamination process. So um, that, that was the beginning of me transitioning into the medical device space. So once you create a device or you have the concept or idea, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, you at that point you're seeking funding. So, um, and this was 2000, 2012, um, when we actually um, quit our jobs and left and, you know, pursued uh, this on a full-time basis. So that, that was the transition point right there, 2012 at uh, Great Memorial Hospital. <laughs> I think I saw uh, a graphic today that said an entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and then builds a plane on the way down. So uh, <laughs> you're talking about <laughs> you're talking about leaving a job and you know seeking the funding. I can totally uh, I can totally understand the the depth of that and the passion that must have been behind um, your device. I, I'm going to hand this over to Justin to uh, to dig into a little bit more of what that process actually looked like. Sure. Yeah, Sean, I was going to, I was going to ask, you know, the fi going through 510k approval, maybe give everybody <laughs> a little bit of an understanding about just how difficult that process can be, especially like you said, with a new device, there's obviously a lot of considerations and a lot of challenges that you have to meet as you go through that. Oh, for sure. So the, the wonderful thing was, you know, as, 
you, when you partner up with uh, uh, various uh, entrepreneurs and and you, you try to do the things that are uh, within your wheelhouse because you can do it more efficiently. But one of the things that nobody really wanted to do was pursue the uh, 510 clearance and manage that process. So I got stuck with it. Uh, <laughs> so really, it's, uh, it is it is a, a long process, um, but I can tell you that we had some pretty good people around us. Uh, we had an FDA consultant that was out of D.C. Uh, that helped us tremendously, and her name was uh, Patsy Trist- Tristler. Um, and she used to be a reviewer, so she was able to give me a lot of insights and advice on how to draft a 510 clearance. So that was very helpful. The other thing was our, our device is a class two device. Um, it's really uh, the first containment device really that has an organizational aspect to it so that it ties in with point of views cleaning in the OR. And where the OR techs are supposed to wipe down and decontaminate their instruments as they're going through the case to concluding the case, um, they would then use our device. And it's an apparatus that attaches to the actual containment device itself that opens all the ring handle instruments. And so from a 510 standpoint, again, that would be a class two device. And so first and foremost, we had to find a predicate uh, for that. Um, class two devices allow you to look in the industry and look for similar things that have been cleared, um, within the FDA under class two. And therefore it, it, on premise, it's supposed to make it an easier process for the reviewer, um, as well as a quicker process for you to get your clearance because there are existing devices out there uh, for that. And so, Knowing the predicates, um, knowing and having the expertise with the uh, FDA reviewer and consultant that we were using, um, you know, we, we comprised our uh, 510 um, or really all, along the same time we were building our quality system. So that helped tremendously as well because within the 510 clearance application, you actually have to have uh, risk hazard analysis, um, you, you, which basically illustrates the risk that the device um, poses to i.e. the patient and or the user. Um, and so that tied in well with our, our quality system at the time as well. Um, and, you know, so once we filed the, uh, the paperwork to get our clearance, I think we actually got it in 72 days, uh, from which is fairly quick and, and unheard of, uh, to be honest with you. Um, a lot of people wait six months. And when you're an entrepreneur, six months or more, and when you're an entrepreneur, every day you're burning cash. And, you know, cash is king when you're, you know, trying to build a company. So, um, you know, they, they, that's a, uh, we got that pretty quick. So we were very uh, grateful for that. Um, as far as the, um, you know, 510 process, once we dug into it, it, it you know, I can do it again now. Um, it's just doing it for the first time, you have a lot of unknowns. Um, so, so Sean, what's, what's so interesting about your medical device in particular in this conversation that we're having today, uh, in regards to devices and IFUs is yours actually makes it easier to clean instruments with, uh, many medical devices yeah. out there. <laughs> the challenge is the cleaning, uh, and so I really think that perspective, you know, that you're bringing to this uh, interview is going to be helpful for us as we dive in, you know, to and I'll just kind of pitch this up here. Um, what do you think now, you know, seeing both sides uh, of the coin, even into the OR, as you said, uh, back with your scrub tech days, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge to collaboration between manufacturers and frontline SPD professionals? Wow. Well, it, it, in my opinion, it's really just the know-how, um, the knowledge gap that exists between the manufacturers and SPD. Um, so you really don't have a mechanism or individuals with um, knowledge to be able to br- b- bridge that gap. Um, and, and the gap that I'm referring to is, well, what if I'm the manufacturer – what will SPD need or how can I facilitate their job so that they can do what they need to do for my device? Mm -hmm. On the flip side, SPD, 
really there's a knowledge gap there as well because um, they they don't usually understand how the IFUs are derived, um, lab validations, uh, that process, um, and then unless you're a very inquisitive person, um, you really don't get into the intricacies of the manufacturing of the actual device itself. Uh, so, for example, with scopes, you know, curiosity, I would want to know what I'm sticking the brush into, what that material is made of, mm-hmm. uh, so that when I am decontaminating that device, I'm not putting or doing um, more damage than, in fact, if I actually use, you know, something else to clean the device. Um, the interesting thing with validations uh, with the lab work is that there are a number of labs across the country that do it. Um, and depending on the complexity of the device and or the relationship between the manufacturer and the lab itself, um, you can get into um, various labs that, uh, for all intents and purposes, are more lax or lenient than others. Mm-hmm. Um, so I won't name any names, but if you have any, you have a device that, uh, you know, is very complex, um, it, theoretically, you're not supposed to teach to the test. So if your device uh, fails validation, um, then you go back into that uh, development mode where you actually refine the device, um, mitigate so that the device could actually clear a sterilization and clean validation appropriately. But some labs, uh, I've been told, um, will, you know, have or modify their test sites so that it doesn't actually uh, create necessarily a worst case scenario. Does that make sense? It, it does, and I just want to say it's okay to name names, Sean. <laughs> 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 just kidding. <laughs> Well, yes, you know, but you're kind of saying they're gaming the system a little bit to uh, achieve a desired outcome. Correct, and you, and you can't do that. Like, um, for example, the reason why FDA got away from doing extended cycles or allowing extended cycles is because people were, were gaming the system, changing the pulse rates of the sterilizer to pass the half cycle um, steam sterilization validation. And so what that did was it created a uh, hardship for sterile processing departments because now there's not a standard number of cycles. There are many different cycles. And if you have, if you're like any other sterile processing department, you might have 50 to 60 different manufacturers coming through there. Um, just on, you know, uh, orthopedic loaner trays or, you know, between spine and ortho um, and neuro. So it can get very complex and it, it caused actual uh, difficulty and, and um, you know, uncertainty in the sterile processing or the hospital world, in my opinion. It definitely does because I think one of the major challenges with having all these different cycles is, you know, what's the rule around running these devices through the sterilizer? Because it's not like a min and a max it's tested at an exact number, right, an exact cycle time. And so how do people handle that with all these varied cycle times with different devices, such as you just said? You know, they kind of make it fit what they're trying to achieve. Well, it's interesting. That, that's a great question. I um, just recently I was doing some consulting for a hospital in, in Florida, and I got a phone call, and one of the questions were about the cycle times and the pulse rates. Well, these were – this was, a, I think, a gravity cycle that they were that the manufacturer was recommending, and all the sterilizers in that hospital are set for prevac. So unless you have somebody in sterile processing that understands how to um, uh, change those cycles on the sterilizer, you you really you, one of two things are going to happen: they're not going to process that device, um, they're, so they're not going to purchase that device. Or two, they're going to improperly sterilize that device on the wrong cycle. So, which that gets them in trouble, um, you know, if that was ever realized uh, on an inspection or and or internal audit. Yeah, that's a great point, Sean. The that complexity, then, if it exists, in order to overcome it, it has to be written into the competency of the technician in their training and then annual competencies for checkups to ensure that if there is that variation on those cycles that everybody on the team, all three shifts and on the weekends, uh, know how to do this. And it's not one of those things that 
only in the daytime, only when the lead tech is around, can we do these more complex items. And if they're not here, it either sits on the shelf and waits, yep. or as you said, it gets done improperly. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to what you said earlier, though, about the inquisitive nature uh, and kind of positive effects of just wanting to ask the question, you know, what is the inside of the scope made of? What am I putting this brush onto? If a, if a technician is wanting to ask those questions and get answers, where do they go? Where did you encourage them to reach out to learn more about what it is they're doing? Yeah, typically um, the first person I reach out to is the actual representative. And depending on the device, they might actually have some clinical people on staff. Um, the, you know, if it's a startup company or not a large uh, company like a Striker or a Medtronic or somebody like that, or even Olympus, um, then the, the first default is going to be the sales rep. Um, now, depend, you know, sales reps, they, they're some good, there's some good ones and there's some bad ones, you know, uh, or I won't say bad ones, but less experienced ones, um, who, don't really know the intricacies of the manufacturing process. They know the sales side of it, but they don't know either the device um, validation, the cleaning, um, and or the the internal workings of the device, like uh, if you were asked to ask them a technical question about it. Uh, the second person I would probably reach out to is just call the 1-800 number with the company and say, hey, I'm, you know, I have this device. I work for such and such hospital. I'm just curious uh, about the inner workings of the device as it pertains to uh, properly decontaminating it and properly uh, sterilizing it, um, you know, for future use. And most likely um, you will get somebody on the other side of that uh, phone who then now is a technical person, i.e. Might, you might even get an engineer. Um, and they're supposed to take customer feedback. That's usually within their quality system if they're an ISO certified company. Um, that uh, internal feedback coming from the actual user is something that they'll want to catalog and, um, you know, use for future meetings and or future modifications to the device, particularly if you have any suggestions during the dialogue from when, you, you know, your original question came up. Yeah, that's a great point about the 1-800 number or just the number um, to the manufacturer. I've had folks on my team make those calls, and just like you said, they end up talking to an engineer or talk to a technical guy, and, uh, and they get a lot of interesting answers, even clarifications on some of these confusing IFUs that are out there um, that just reading the IFU over and over and over again, you would have never figured out what it's actually talking about, but you get a live body on the phone who can walk you through it and explain, you know, maybe the language or uh, uh, to talk the nomenclature that they're using. So uh, that's a great point there. Um, or, even the, or even the rationale behind, you know, why they uh, listed something. Um, you know, the interesting thing about a manufacturer's IFU uh, is that keep in mind their main goal is to pass their validation test, right? So when you see IFUs that are very intricate in nature, um, they're derived with that in mind as well as to mitigate risk, which um, for their um, you know, risk hazard analysis and or their FEMA um, uh, failure, uh, uh, failure mode effective analysis, they are actually – they can't mitigate risk via their IFU anymore, according to the FDA. So really it's in an effort to pass their validation now, um, which mm. doesn't keep you in mind because yeah. those validations are typically done in a, you know, a lab setting, which is not in a real world setting. And that's what tripped up actually Olympus because then when the FDA came back and issued um those particular warnings to them, they actually told them to go back and do surveillance in the actual hospital and to revise their IFUs based on that surveillance. Well, so you're bringing up a great point with the Olympus issue that it's a very well-known IFU and process-related quality breakdown with infection outbreaks across the country. Um, to that point, then, what impact 
do these complicated, convoluted, incomplete IFUs have on the everyday work product of sterile processing departments? So what's actually getting into the OR? And then, as you said, you know, that complexity, uh, if, you, if you want to look at maybe loaner instrumentation, you, you got five different vendors, you got five different time for enzymatic soaking, for rinsing, for ultrasonic, all the process that goes in there. And I'm I'm even thinking about my department. We have 10 different signs posted with each their own manufacturer um, instructions for processing. Because I know, as a sterile processing leader, I'm responsible for these trays, not just getting done the best we can do or the way that we always do, but getting done the way that they're validated to be decontaminated. So, uh, you know, speaking from your background and then your consulting experience, um, is it just a safety danger to the patient or does it really impact the department and the flow more than that? Mm, it's um, Well, it can't be a cascading effect that ultimately ends up uh, hurting the patient. Uh, whether it causes an a, a accident um, uh, and or a death really depends on mm, the the acuity of the department, uh, the training, um, uh, standardization. Um, and when I when I reference standardization, I mean um, instead of having you know fifteen different devices, fifteen different manufacturers, if you could consolidate or standardize. Um, what would that look like? And, you know, if you couldn't, you know, reduce it down to, let's say, the top five and your your physicians and or staff are OK with that, that would be one rec- recommendation. Because the effect of having all those various devices and cycle times is that it creates an unnecessary bottleneck in your department. Mm-hmm. And uh, the cascading effect of that is if you, you've created a time delay and you've got pressure to get it back to the OR for another particular case, um, you know, does the technician push back and say, no, I have to do this according to the IFU, or do they start cutting corners? Mm-hmm. And when you start cutting corners, that's when, you know, patients uh, can be impacted at that point. Um, go ahead. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Sean, that, that reality, that pressure to cut corners is, is real. You can feel it sometimes when you walk in departments uh, to have busy operating rooms. Maybe they're understaffed or uh, Mm under-equipped in terms of their washers and their autoclaves. Um, And yeah, that's the lowest hanging fruit to get this tray back to the customer quicker as well. I can cut corners. Uh, we're not going to skip the sterilizer. It'll still go in the sterilizer, but maybe it'll go in a shorter cycle. Or we're not going to skip decontam, you know, but maybe we're going to do a workaround that's not recommended by the manufacturer. Um, and it it is hard even for new leaders who come into departments with a, a, a vision and a burden to change these processes to improve it if – if your operating room has had an expected turnaround time of an hour and a half for the last 10 years, um, that's going to be a big cultural hill to climb <laughs> to push back and say, nope, uh, that's going away tomorrow, guys. And we're going to have a lot of investment to put in these trays and yeah. equipment and training uh, competencies for our staff. So um, huge battle there for folks to uh, to be confident in stopping the line as a sterile processing technician, you know, you okay. may be saying no to a surgeon yeah. uh, and not a lot of us have that backbone. Well, you know, one of the good things that a, a great rep can, can help you with, and, and that is educating all those other individuals, the user, the surgeon, the nurse, the technicians up in the OR, so that when you do have to make those decisions, as a sterile processing um, person, you're not making that decision or they're not thinking you're making that decision in the vacuum. They fully understand the device, the complexities of the device, how it's going to be processed, the timeline associated with, with processing it. And it, it takes some of the heat off of you uh, or the SPD staff and leadership. Um, so where you, you, 
you don't have to necessarily push back because now they're they're all on the same page, you know, to include the physician. Um, you know, that that I would if if I could think of anything that a device rep could do to help, that would be one of them. Um, you know, not just sell, but to actually educate and inform because they are representing the the company and through their training process, they are supposed to be familiar with the device as well as with the IFUs. Um, because, you know, again, they're the frontline person. So they, they actually take feedback back to the, the manufacturer or the company that they represent. So they'd be the person that I, I, I'd have them do it, you know, religiously. Yeah, and you're really talking about communication and effective communication. And one of the topics on an earlier podcast was about pulling in all the different departments, but more focused around data, where this is really more about advocating the smart and safe decision for the patient. And in that vein, is it also, and I'll, I'll, I, it's a two part question. I'll ask you the first part. Is it reasonable to expect that when there's a change to that IFU, that the sales rep would be able to go and in service and have all those points of contact when you look at really what the size of their territories or geographies should be. I know it's ideal, but mm-hmm. in the real world, is that something that's reasonable to expect that when there is a change that's made that they can get in front of every scrub tech and every surgeon and every sterile processing technician on every shift at all the different facilities that may be using their device? Mm. Um, that's a great question. The I'll take it in two parts. Um, well, so some manufacturers they have distributors. Okay, those distributors they act like reps, but they're not really representing the company as they would uh, as a full time employee or full time sales rep would. So in some cases, for the the depending on the device, there can be a disconnect. So in that case. Um, it, it probably wouldn't be efficient for them to actually go out and, and see everybody. Um, you know, they're not going to do the, the missionary work, so to speak, because they are the distributor. Um, and there's some good ones and there's some you know, not so good ones. Um, for the reps, uh, the larger companies, they can actually push out, um, you know, a change in their IFU and get everybody in service via their, you know, um, their rep talent or sales reps. Um but a lot of times, let's say if they just make a change, um, you know, the FDA and, you know, their own internal um, ISO or quality documents, you see a lot of them moving to having their IFUs online now. So there's an actual no paper because technically if uh, within their labeling um, requirements, they send out actual paper IFUs, they're actually supposed to make sure that though a preceding rev of that IFU is not on site at that particular customer's hospital. So it's kind of twofold. The rep would have to then pull the, all the old IFUs or make sure that they're pulled and then educate and in-service uh, that particular customer on what has changed uh, from that department. So it really depends, just to get back to answering your question, uh, on how big the firm is and how, how, much, uh, how many employees they have to deploy to um, educate one, once a change is made on the IFU. I can tell you if it's a critical item dealing with uh, sterility um, and or reprocessing, um, then the manufacturer will make sure that uh, that information is gotten out. Yeah, I think so, but it just seems like such a challenge in many cases. There's so much emphasis on let's get the in-service up front. It's a brand new device. You've never seen it before, but then yep. those changes, and even you brought up a really good point in there, which is how do we remove the previous IFU so somebody doesn't reference the wrong document at all those facilities. So it's not just coming in and talking. There's a actual operational aspect to updating. And then you look at how are they maintaining those IFUs? Are they utilizing a service like OneSource? Do they have books that are housing printed documents of the IFU? Like there's a lot of different things. And I think Hank and I talked about this before we came on for the interview. I had contributed to an article in Healthcare 
purchasing news back in 2013, and it was really focusing on how UDI might be able to, the UDI laws might be able to play a role here because part of the proposed regulation at one time was to have the instructions for the use of the device included in that reporting. So then there would be one data warehouse for the most current version of the IFU. And I think in an ideal world, what we would all envision would be there would a, a screen right at the decon sink and then every device would be marked at the instrument level. You would be able to scan it and the most up-to-date instructions for use as pulled down from a service maintained by the FDA would pop right up yep. and remind you about how you're supposed to process that device and really reduce a lot of those types of, of concerns. So I could even yep. see it addressing our cycle times, but we're obviously a ways away off from that, but I thought maybe you might want to chime in on sort of that idealism of how I think we all wish it worked. Yeah, well, just before I, um, uh, you know, now a board member of my company, and so I'm not I'm, I'm not in a full-time capacity at, at, at Restore, um, but prior to my me moving out of a full-time position, one of the things that we were exploring was actual being compliant with UDI. So the GUID database, or GU database, some, some people call it, um, it's 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 as good as the data that is submitted, right? So you have all these criteria or this criteria that the manufacturers have to um, input into that database, and um, you know firms are having uh, or some firms are having difficulty in getting this data to the FDA, um, with particularly within the timeline uh, associated with it. For example, our device was a class two device, but it also had an accessory component to it. So the class two device has to be compliant with um, UDI by, I, I believe, October of 2016. So, but the accessories then, according to the, the language, they also had to be direct marked, right? Um, and so, but when you get in a hospital, those accessories could be commingled or interchanged um, many times. And so if you were going to do a recall or anything like that, you, you would still find it very difficult to um, actually find the actual device associated with the containment device because they're used interchangeably. Um, and so when we were looking at it, you know, we, we just, we there, there was some extra questions that we had. And I just read an article um, probably about a month ago that they, they actually delayed rolling out the um, UDI requirements, I believe, for, for direct marking. Um, because of the complexities of it. The other thing is for, let's say, orthopedic loaner trays, right? Well, the tray itself has to be direct marked, right? But then you have all the, the instruments that are inside, which are class one devices, and they can go and be interchanged with other kit, kits and containers. So you can see where it could become very complicated uh, for the manufacturer. And that hasn't even gotten to the hospital yet where, um, like for Hank or his staff, well, where do you download all this information? Where do you get it from? Can you parse it out? Can you do a query in it? Um, you know, you don't want every device because you might not have every device in your hospital. So there's, there's a lot of learning that, you know, both the manufacturer and the hospitals have to uh, get up to speed on in reference to UDI. Yeah, Sean, you bring up a, a great point on just having the access to IFUs it hopefully would have an impact on compliance rates, but uh, you know, obviously, depending on the size of the IFU, you know, some of these babies are 100, 200 pages long, multiple languages, and yep. the particular area that you're standing at the moment, uh, that you need the IFU if you're in decontam and full PPE, and you just want to know how do I clean this item appropriately, uh, that's not. It may be accessible, but <laughs> yeah. that's uh, that's it. So there's a, a higher barrier there maybe that we need to be reaching as an industry. Um, I wanted to pull you over into a particular question, though, as it regards to the FDA's role in how, as manufacturers, that IFU, that validation process is occurring with the end 
um, user, or should we say the end processor in mind uh, in terms of sterile processing. So I published a blog last summer uh, mm -hmm. talking about the impossibility of IFU compliance. Uh, you know, some of it is access, but uh, a lot of it just goes down to that complexity. So do you feel like the FDA should be stepping up and asking manufacturers to choose, I don't know, one of three standardized processing options so that at the very least, as a facility, I know anything that's going to come into my door, I, I have the tools that I need to process it. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, um, well, I'm going to tackle this in, in, in probably a different way. Um, so a lot of devices, I mean, you have varying materials for these devices, which then gets you to um, it, which dictates uh, the type of processing um, that will be needed for that device. So uh, in, a, in a perfect world, I would say that would be, uh, you know, wonderful. Um, but then as I look at the landscape of the devices that are on the marketplace and then the ever changing, uh, devices and or evolution of, you know, uh, miniaturizing, um, certain things, uh, it, it it's going to get complex and you're going to, you're not going to be able to standardize it so much because of the, the multitudes of devices and the materials that these devices are made from in the marketplace. Um, I would, the best way I think to do that is to make sure that you have uh, communication with the surgeon and your um, group purchasing uh, committee um, so that they really understand that um, if they make a decision to buy a device, if, you know, golden rule is if you can't clean it, you can't sterilize it, don't buy it, or it's a one-time use product. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it will be a one-time use product. And so educating them and, and that group, um, you know, really, it, it, it empowers them to actually say, oh, well, wait a minute. You know, it, are there alternative devices out there that actually um, adhere to or, or, or can be processed with these three standardized or four standardized cycles? Um, so it gets them thinking and, again, gets you off the hook for being the bad guy to say, I ah, don't buy that, you mm -hmm. know. Um, but I think the landscape from a manufacturing standpoint and or the way technology changes so fast that it's going to be very difficult for the FDA to, to come up with or, or even enforce, you know, a standard, you know, standard sterilization cycles. I think where they did get involved in it was they told manufacturers that they will no longer accept, you know, five tens with extended cycles. So I think that in that case, they did. I think help sterile processing, um, you know, with you know reducing the amount of variability that you would face in, in the sterile processing department. Well, so you brought up a uh, topic that we covered in our first episode um, in talking to Michael Matthews about collaborating with infection control. But one of the uh, one of the things that I want to throw out to leaders listening to this episode, either from this sterile processing side, purchasing side, operating room, you've really got to get sterile processing representation in those meetings, like you said, where these purchasing decisions are being discussed. Um, anything that's going to have any accessory or uh, be required to be processed through the SPD um, it is just critical to have someone there who can say yay or nay mm -hmm. in our current state can we process this? A great example um, is if your facility is buying the first Da Vinci, uh, you, you need to have a serious conversation about what is required to process that equipment. And, you know, maybe not even what's required by the manufacturer, but just best practices. Uh, do we want to be at the bottom of that spectrum or do we want to be at the top? And if we're going to be spending all this money on a robot, um, yeah. throw in the equipment that you actually need to process it correctly. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, I posted an a article on LinkedIn about, and it really wasn't clear in the article, um, whether it was an accessory, an attachment, or was actually integrated into the actual scope itself. 
But one of the problems that the article um, illustrated was that during surgery, uh, it's it, the scope. It's hard for the scope to actually apply counter traction and or move tissue out of the way for visualization and or um, some type of biopsy or, or something like that. So this arm is extended out from the scope, the distal end of the scope, um, and it's made from, you know, various um, uh, biocompatible um, resins and or um, composites. Um, and it's powered by a water source. So it moves up and down and articulates left and right. But we all know how small gastroscopes are, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have this articulating arm, which has the complexity of moving left and right, up and down. Um, so I'm envisioning, based on the pictures, um, if that is a device that is reprocessable just like the scope, um, you're opening a can of worms for sterile processing departments and don't even know it. And, and this product is actually being developed, I think, out of uh, at least the article was out of Harvard. So what you have is uh, engineers who are developing devices that have no clue about sterile processing and, and the cascading effects or the long-term effects of having a device that's so complex works in the operative theater, but can't be cleaned in sterile processing. You know, they, it, it, it just boggles the mind. So I'm hoping that device is an, an actual one-time use accessory that is clipped to the scope uh, somehow, so that sterile processing departments don't have to worry about another thing that, you know, is so tiny and so complex to clean, um, you know, just causes issues for the patients out there. So, Sean, we covered a lot of ground today um, on the medical device side related to IFUs, related to standardization and technology uh, we're going to have a lot of frontline technicians listening to the show. How mm -hmm. would you recommend uh, a listener who to sit there thinking, you know what, this matters. I want my department, I want my facility, I want our patients to always have equipment that have been processed, um, investigated, tracked, and documented that all of their equipment is as safe as humanly possible. How would you advise those listeners out there who want to get involved to mm -hmm. get started to make their voice known? Wow, um, you know, whether well, you know, first, first and foremost is you know, I talked about just having that innate curiosity in the beginning of the podcast, um, and and reading as much as you can about you know the impacts of the department, the devices itself you know, how the devices are made and start educating other people within the hospital. Um, you know, when I was in sterile processing, you know, I wanted that department to be the model across the country. And I told the staff that um, you actually, uh, from a standpoint of importance, nobody's probably ever told you this, but your one department um, can impact uh, the hospital as well as all the patients that come in surgery um, and so your job is just as important as nursing care, as a physician, uh, you know, so treat it as such. Um, and knowing and educating yourself about these devices and the complexities of them, uh, how they're used, um, empowers you to, to actually be that advocate in the sterile processing department and or the industry that you need to be. Social media is another aspect where you know, we are all networking on social media, talking about sterile processing, the industry, the medical device sector. Um, and you, what you end up finding is you start communicating with other people that, um, you know, really, you know, are, are siloed or in another industry that have no idea. So you're building those bridges between other industries. Um, and so the more that they can do that, the more education that they get in reference to their 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 field, their occupation. Um, will, you know, empower them to understand how, how important their job is. And I can't stress that enough for sterile processing technicians. You know, it's it, whether you're perceived as a dishwasher or whatever, um, that is definitely not the case. Um, and again, as these devices become more and more complex, the FDA and CMS and Joint Commission, the hospital administration, the physicians, 
they're all going to look for sterile process and step up and make sure that these devices are clean properly. Um, so it's an ever evolving, changing industry. And uh, I, I think it just goes up from here um, because people are now becoming aware of, you know, how complex everything is and the, the hard nature of the job. Yeah, it's not getting any less complex. That's for certain, Sean. Um, yeah. I want to really thank you for joining us on the show this week. Um, a really good interview. And the IFU conversation, I feel like this could be a four hour podcast. We could go on <laughs> for a very long time and we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to update, you know, our content in another year and, and talk about IFU some more and, communicate that out to our listeners because this this conversation is not going away it's relevant literally to everything that the frontline technician does on a day-to-day basis and there's so much room for improvement oh yeah well i'll just i'll you know i'll just make this point um in reference to ifus remember that ifu is from the manufacturer standpoint is geared towards uh clearing their validation and it's typically written by either a technical writer and or engineer or somebody with a uh, background in, um, you know, that device and knowing, you know, you know, the intricacies of the device and getting it cleared through the FDA. Having said that, if you really want to change how these IFUs are written, you got to have somebody on staff on the manufacturing side that understands sterile processing so that when they do draft these, they're drafted in a legible way. Um, and a clear way that it makes it easier for sterile processing to actually interpret and or um, uh, actually um, go through or forward with the IFU with the device once they do get it. So that's a, that would be my recommendation. That's a, that, that is a fantastic point, and you're right. The technical writers obviously know how to take the information that they're given and make it, written properly for communication and specificity, that doesn't mean that they know the industry knowledge to make sure that it's communicated properly to somebody that has to, I think you've put it best, interpret it. So, Sean, thank you very much for joining us this week. Perfect. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. That was Sean Flynn, a consultant, entrepreneur, and medical device inventor, founder and president of the Paratorum Group. And I'll tell you what, Hank, a lot of great stuff in that. I thought the first part of the interview that really got me to chuckle a little bit was when he talked about the 510K process. Not really considered to be the fun job amongst a group of entrepreneurs. Right. I think he described <laughs> it as I got stuck with that. But he clearly learned a lot from it. And, you know, it's a complicated process. I thought the way that he described that in detail, like the purpose of the 510K even sort of the gaming of it a little bit because the end game is let's get the device ready to go to market. That's the reason it's being produced and how they move through that and, and how that process works is was really interesting, including even how they synced up their 510K approval with uh, the building the quality system because of the whole risk analysis component. That's right, yeah, and hopefully a lot of our audience, you know, learned um, – at least something in that process. We've all heard the words 510K, but I know as a frontline technician, when I first got started, that didn't really mean a lot to me. It was some regulation out there far away, and I didn't realize how it touched me as a technician. But Sean really highlighted that, that um, it is often make or break, has an impact on your workflow, has an impact on your ability to do your job Um in a safe manner with a safe ending for the patient. So um, I really liked how he highlighted the importance of being inquisitive in your job in relations to IFUs. If you don't understand how they're, how they're being written or how they should be applied, call somebody. Call the sales guy who, who sold that item into the hospital. If they can't help you, maybe the clinical educator on their team can. Or... Uh, he really pulled out <laughs> this one out of the history books. Call the 1-800 number. Uh, <laughs> they, you can actually get someone on the line, oftentimes an engineer or someone with maybe some more technical expertise who can speak to and translate uh, that IFU that was written 
for their validation and their testing to actually into real life. How do we get this clean in a hospital setting? Yeah, and, and really we talked a lot about communication as well. And one element of communication, I had some things lined up, but I think he really brought up a great point that I hadn't thought of, which is how that IFU is developed. It's written by a technical writer, and he mentioned that one process improvement, at least in the short term, would be to have an SPD expert helping to write those instructions for use, not only to make sure that they're sort of relevant uh, and that they take in all the different considerations for the frontline staff, but also to just make it more easier to interpret and make sure that maybe even some of those cycle time questions are spelled out a little bit more straightforward. That's right. Hopefully our audience were dusting off their resume there and saying, okay, I know what's next after my 10 years here at the hospital. I'm going to put in for these device manufacturers and consulting there. And it doesn't have to be a full-time job, but if you have the expertise in that frontline understanding of the good and the bad in terms of how these things are written or developed, uh, why not? Why not be an advocate there at the front of the line? Um, I love the point that he brought up with utilizing sales reps to be your voice and your advocate into the operating room and into the physician's ears. Um, I know as technicians and even sometimes as sterile processing leaders, if we have a concern or if we have uh, a, a workflow challenge based on IFU, sometimes it's hard to communicate the importance of that to the other side uh, to the hospital. And having these sales reps who have the ear of the physician, they have the respect uh, to the OR team because they're the ones that are bringing this shiny uh, new piece of equipment in. Why not utilize them to be your advocate and to help communicate? All right, this is going to be the fastest turnaround time possible. This is how this item is going to have to be taken apart in sterile processing. So they kind of understand it's not just a, a rinse and dash kind of scenario there. It's a bit more complicated. So I really appreciated him giving us uh, that great piece of advice. Yeah, Sean was an excellent guest because he's been on both sides of the equation as a vendor and a uh, healthcare provider in, in working in SPD. So looking forward to having him back again. We've kind of lined that up because he has another story to tell. We'll set the table and leave a little bit of mystery there for our listeners, but you will be hearing from Sean again, and I think you will find the topic to be uh, incredibly engaging, if not a little off the topic of instructions for use for certain, but that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to us as we continue to develop the show and would love to uh, hear if you have recommendations for guests that you would like to hear us and bring on an interview. So thank you again for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean. 